Join me, Susan Regan, host of Connecticut Valley Views, the most widely watched interview program on Connecticut Public Access TV. Proof to the people is the byline, insight without bias, generating a 360 perspective. Our mission is to focus on topical subjects with thought-provoking interviews regarding municipal leadership, current affairs, educational and political topics, as well as key destination points in New England. And here's your host for Connecticut Valley Views, Susan Regan. Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My guest is Chris Powell. He is the managing editor of the Journal Inquirer, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Chris, Susan, yeah, delighted to be I'm with delighted. you. I've been looking forward to this, to tell you the truth. Tell me another one. A man said, <laughs> I have, I have. It's the truth. Um, just tell me a, a, a brief, uh, obviously, you've been editor of the Journal Inquirer for a number of years, but you know, give us a little brief thing how you got into this business. Well, I, I got a job at uh, the two weeklies that preceded the Journal Enquirer back when I got out of high school in Manchester in 1967 and worked at uh, the papers uh, after they consolidated into a daily the following year while I was going to, to UConn and uh, eventually I got tired of UConn and I had a job at the paper waiting for me so I went to work at uh, the newspaper and I uh, what they do? Tell you to go out and search stories? Go out and well, uh, for you know, a while I worked in the press room. I worked mm -hmm. in the circulation department, and uh, uh, increasingly I worked more and more in the news department. It was uh, usually cleaner work, yeah. um, and I really just happened to be the second uh, senior editor at uh, the operation when the, my predecessor had his last and catastrophic nervous breakdown <laughs> and. Um, the, the job really just uh, defaulted to me. Well, it's, it's, it's opportunity. Everything is timing, opportunity. And did you think it would be a challenge, or was it something you felt, hey, I can do this? Uh, well, you know, I had, had apprenticed uh, to it, and uh, under the circumstances, uh, I had to do it because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the guy had just uh, walked out the door. So mm -hmm. uh, it was a much smaller operation mm -hmm. then. Um, so. Uh, there was room to learn without, uh, you know, too many catastrophic consequences. You, did you feel that you were starting to formulate your idea of how what a new newspaper should be, what 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 should can Because what we're going to talk about here, you, the uh, JI was founded in 1968. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, we want to talk about that philosophy um, quite a bit because it's an interesting one. I think it's one that probably most publications aspire to. But for one reason or another, in order to exist, maybe they don't stick with it. But it mm -hmm. seems as though you have. And I'm, I'm just going to read this because it's a quote. More than most newspapers, the Journal Inquirer stands for something. It is more questioning cri and critical than most other newspapers. What is published in the Journal Inquirer is less likely to be influenced by considerations. And I think that's where other, other publications uh, that I was talking about, unrelated to the news. The Journal Enquirer's news and opinion columns are more accessible to its readers. In these circumstances, the truth is more likely to emerge and the people will be served better. Now, that's something you have stuck by, is that not? Well, yes, but, you know, the, the intent, the, the thought there, Susan, really arises from uh, our, our owners, uh, the Ellis family in Manchester, mm -hmm. Neil and Betty Ellis. Uh, uh, Neil... Uh, really, I think, always wanted to be in the newspaper mm. business, and he got in the position where he could purchase one after he'd uh, become a successful property developer, mm. and uh, uh, he wanted a newspaper that uh, would be independent and mm. would be critical and questioning, and I, I think uh, that philosophy of his has really, uh, you know, permeated the paper uh, through all, all this time. I mean, it doesn't make us... Uh, perfect by any means, but uh, I think people, you know, recognize we do have some, some independence and we're not afraid to, to ask the inconvenient question. We're not uh, afraid to, to criticize. Well, isn't that part of the story, the asking of the questions and getting to the truth? Because if, in fact, you are publishing something that you're either taking a stab at it or giving your opinion or giving your slant on it, because good writing and good editorial depends on having facts. And if you can't substantiate those facts, you've, you've really published you know, fiction. Yeah, well, the reporting is the basis of, uh, of everything. You really cannot have 
a useful opinion unless you know what you're, you're talking about, and that requires having uh, reporters, and really for a newspaper of our size. Uh, How many reporters do you have? Well, well, just on the news side now, we've, uh, I think, probably got close to, to 15. You have to remember we're trying to cover 17 towns. We're trying to have good state news coverage, good state capital coverage, some, some business coverage. That's not counting the, the sports staff or the, uh, the living uh, mm -hmm. section staff. Um, but you, you can't have town news reporting without mm -hmm. uh, reporters, and, and town news reporting really is the uh, most expensive reporting, the most expensive well, well, news. Why is that the most uh, because the, the, uh, the content doesn't go as far. If you have a, ah. a national story, well, presumably it might theoretically be of interest to anybody in the country. If you have a state story, it might be of interest mm -hmm. to anybody in the state. But if you've got a story about uh, mm -hmm. one particular town, Odds are it will not have much interest to anybody outside the town. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, you have to still have to hire a reporter to cover that story. Now, you can, you can hire a reporter to cover a story that might be of interest to the 10,000 people who live in that town, or you can hire a reporter to write a story that might be of interest to 300 million people throughout the country. Um, the story that will interest 300 million people will go a lot farther. Um, the, the story for the local news is just a lot more expensive. It is just the, much, the, the, the most expensive component of well, journalism. Having, having, having said that, have you found that your readership has changed or emerged or somehow fo has a different focus than it used to where, let's just say for instance, it used to be that they were interested in the local town news, but now these days or in the past few years, it's kind of like don't care too much about mm. what's just happening with the Opal. The, the recent opening of the local Walmart, and they're more interested in what's happening on a national scene. Oh, ver very much changed? so. Things have changed. Um, and uh, really the premise of our newspaper, and I think the premise of every newspaper in Connecticut, probably throughout the country, is, is very much in question. Uh, the, the Journal Inquirer is premised on the belief that people wanted a local newspaper, that they wanted mm -hmm. to be involved in their uh, community and that that was what was most important to them. That's not necessarily in force anymore. I mean, these days, uh, between a quarter and a third of the eligible adult population in Connecticut does not even register to vote. Um, if you if you calculate voter participation and elections in Connecticut, not just as a share of uh, registered voters who mm -hmm. participate, but as a share of the total eligible adult population. Mm -hmm. That is, if you calculate it by all adults registered and not, uh, you find out that you know perhaps half the population is not voting in presidential elections, two-thirds is not voting in state elections, and 85, 90 percent is not voting in municipal elections. Well, if people no longer care about their local geographic community, uh, uh, local newspapers like the Journal yeah. Enquirer may not have very much to uh, to offer them. They, they, people certainly don't need the Journal Inquirer to keep up with the Kardashians. Right, right, right. Well, in giving, in having your reporters now, and you have the staff, obviously the ones that are doing sports or sports and, and maybe living, do you ever, do you find some of your reporters are better at getting some stories or getting information or investigating, in other words, or do you let them kind of switch around and cover different sections so that they're pretty diversified? So in case one is yeah, sick, he can still cover that. Kind yeah, of there's story. not really a, an awful lot of specialization on our reporting mm -hmm. staff. I mean, we do have a reporter or two who spend more time in the courts. I mean, we have one court reporter, Alex Wood, who is. Uh, has great expertise in the court system. I think he's really qualified to mm -hmm. be a lawyer. He really does many things that mm -hmm. uh, a lawyer would do, though he does it without uh, a license, uh, though he's not practicing law. Uh, we have a, a state capital reporter who I think is as good as any uh, at the uh, at the Capitol now. We, we have an investigative reporter who's done some pretty substantial stuff. Uh, um, but. Uh, they specialize to to a great extent, but they're uh, capable of covering whatever. Yeah, but uh, you know, I think almost anybody here could cover you know anything. Some better than others, of course, but uh, I think most of our town reporters have the basic skills necessary to cover almost any town. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, one of the things I noticed up on your wall, one of one of the. Um, things that you have framed here, and, and it, I think it kind of summarizes your philosophy. It says, a good editor has no friends, and that was, that was by Joseph Pulitzer. 
And so when you go after the truth, and as you said, you know, sometimes it's not going to be a happy question. You may not, you may find an evasive answer, but the fact of the matter is maybe you hit a home run when in fact that happens. Yeah, well, you know, it's nice to have friends, and I, I wouldn't want to suggest that, uh, you know, the newspaper doesn't want friends. <laughs> I mean, we certainly want subscribers. Uh, we want advertisers. I think really what Pulitzer was, was saying that uh, was that you, uh, uh, you can't uh, go easy on your friends when they're in the news. Uh, when, when you're in the news, you've got to put critical questions to everybody, even if they're your friends. Well, quite honestly, your readers will actually like you and be your friend because you're giving them the truth. Well, Thank some you. of them will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we all have things that we'd rather not see in the right. newspaper. Right. And uh, I, uh, you know, often deal with that uh, very intimately with... Uh, with people, um, you know, I, I try to uh, act in what strikes me as the general yes. interest, the public yes. interest in, in knowing things, but there are certain issues that people don't want covered, and uh, sometimes it's not just for uh, from personal or family reasons. They just don't think certain things should be covered, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, they, they may have a point. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think the fact of the matter is, is that if you really, if you, if, if a person is going to do something or say something or write something, you always have to say, would you want that to be on the cover of the New York Times, whatever it is you're saying, doing, or... Yeah, well, I, I wish we could get some things on the cover of the New York <laughs> Times. I mean, they, uh, I know certain stories the New York Times will not cover. Right. Uh, I mean, most news organizations have their blind spots, and, you know, many have, have issues that they really are, I think, actively suppressing. Mm -hmm. uh, they have... Uh, very distinct political agendas. They try to cover them up. Is it the newspaper uh, that's got an agenda, or is it the person who's in the position who can drive that agenda? Uh, well, I think it's somewhat both, but uh, I think most most newspapers in the country, I think, are very reluctant to challenge the government in any serious yeah. way. Um, occasionally, the Times or the Washington Post will will write a story that will set them at war with the government, but there there's also certain stories that I know mm -hmm. the Times and the Post uh, simply will not touch um, because I think they find it just too uh, uh, subversive uh, to to do so. But you know that's really what yeah. the free well, press is supposed to be about. Yeah, I mean, ex exactly. Somebody else should pick up on it. Then. Exactly. Nobody's well, their perfect. readers are going to the, the readers that will read their material are the ones that are already inclined in that direction anyway, just to further substantiate their feelings about things. I mean, we tend to watch the TV. Yeah, and the that's, that's, stations that that's the trouble. Uh, you know, more and more people are really kind of breaking off to pay attention to uh, TV networks and yes. and newspapers and magazines that reinforce their feelings right. rather than challenge their exactly. feelings and exactly. uh, you know we all need to be challenged. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. All right so in keeping with this philosophy you've, you've known for your direct hard-hitting pieces and your biting editorials. Um, I, what I'm going to refer to here is your January 14th 2016 piece. You took on the move by GE to Boston and you said the res responsibility is not the governors alone or ju just with him and the long-standing Democratic Party. And, and here I'm thinking that there's, a, there's enough blame to go around here. But what's been happening in losing businesses, this has been a long, slippery slope, has it not? I mean, Yeah, I, I have a, years. a stable of hobby horses here, Susan, that I yeah. attribute Connecticut's decline to. And I, I, I think they are profoundly mistaken policy premises that have been running up the cost of government and the cost of living in Connecticut without really producing anything of, of, of value. And we take these policies for granted, mm -hmm. uh, even as I think they're, they're destroying the state. And uh, uh, I think General Electric's departure and the, the vaguely unfavorability of uh, the economic climate in Connecticut to to business uh, is, to a great extent, a a a, a product of, of these mistaken policy premises. And uh, uh, you know, if you you know ever have a four-hour show, I'd be glad to go yeah. through them in detail. Yeah. But I could, if you wanted, to identify some of them. Well, 
Well, I would like to have you identify one, but for instance, we, we used to be, um, Hartford used to be the insurance capital of the world. And we had many businesses here that people were, were well known about. I mean, where do you see then? Okay, l let me ask you this question then. Where do you see that? Wh what happened? What was the turning point? But because we were a hub, we were an important business center here, and between Boston and New York and so forth, which made a very good uh, avenue for us to be on. Where did it go wrong? Was there one juncture you can identify? I, I don't think it's any one uh, point, but I, I think I can identify two that were catastrophic and, and really led to uh, uh, other mistakes and, and downfalls. Uh, uh, you know, back in uh, the 1980s and 70s, we established uh, uh, collective bargaining and binding arbitration mm -hmm. for, for public employee unions, and now we are at the point where even the governor's budget director admits that half of the state budget is a matter of what he calls fixed costs. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Not all labor costs, right. but largely labor costs. On the municipal le level, it's like two-thirds of, of the expense. That is, you can't touch it. It's, it's no all negotiation. Well, it's subject well, we to negotiation, but it's it. also subject to binding arbitration, right. which basically puts the, the uh, power of the government employee unions uh, on the same plane as and equal to the power of the government. And uh, I don't think anything uh, is, can, can be allowed to be, you know, bigger than the public sovereignty over its mm -hmm. own institutions. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, so now we basically have taken two-thirds of municipal expense and, you know, approaching half of state government expense out of the ordinary democratic mm -hmm. process and put it into the arbitration process. Mm -hmm. And it's really, you know, beyond control. We, we, we can't control it uh, democratically. Um, I think the, the public employee labor laws that were passed in the 70s and 80s were catastrophic. Uh, I you think said they, there was a second thing. Yeah, well, the, the second thing, I think, was the enactment of the state income tax in, in 1991. And, you know, in, in principle, I'm perfectly glad to support progressive mm -hmm. taxation, but that's not why Connecticut uh, enacted a state income tax under Governor Weicker in 1991. We enacted it mm -hmm. because these mistaken policies that we had adopted in the 70s and 80s had driven government expense up so much we, we couldn't pay for them anymore. The government needed more money. We did not en enact the income tax in 1991 because we, we were after progressive taxation. We, we enacted the income tax in 91 to bail out the government and welfare classes. And uh, uh, that just locked in their privileged position uh, in the system. We had an opportunity in 91 to repeal some of our mistaken policies to to control expense. We didn't do that. We raised taxes. And we've been raising taxes ever since because we have uh, uh, taken so much of uh, public expense out of the democratic process. Uh, but, you know, the, the whole thing is a kind of a philosophy because even beyond those two points, which I, I believe you are correct about that, it seems as though it's become unfriendly. So sort of on top of those issues, on top of these increasing fixed costs, we seem to have taken an attitude of, you know, sometimes we hear about the spending of to keep somebody here, we're going to pay them a lot of money and allow them some credit of tax credit of some kind as long as they, uh, they're going to move their business from mm -hmm. Manchester to, uh, to Hartford or at some, just to keep them in the state. It doesn't even seem to be a wise decision on that. No, it's, it's, it's insane I mean, there policy. Of, yeah. there, there, there are all kinds of other things. Yeah, I mean, we, we're, we, we're taxing everybody in order to give you know, certain financial privileges mm -hmm. to the few. Uh, we, we shouldn't be doing that. We, sh we should be trying to create an environment which is uh, prosperous for, mm -hmm. for everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I think Encourage that's- Encourage entrepreneurial Yeah, well, just to, to, to make it possible for everybody to prosper in Connecticut, not to tax all the smaller businesses so that we can give mm -hmm. United mm -hmm. Technologies mm -hmm. some you know, big bonuses to stay here. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's anti-competitive. I mean, we're- we're, we're, we're giving financial grants to, you know, some bakeries, but not other bakeries. But well, they made the mistake with GE, and that's a big business. Well, it, a lot it, of jobs. It, it is a big business, but, you know, taxes were not the only reason I th uh, for General no. Electric's departure to Boston. There were other reasons there, but uh, I think there are some, some very big tax reasons lurking behind mm -hmm. uh, the General Electric issue that we're not addressing, and, and that is... Uh, 
if we keep our policies as we are uh, in Connecticut, there are going to be massive tax increases in the state f for every year, forever, into the future. Certainly. I mean, we, we, we have a, uh, a new recession coming on. Our mm -hmm. tax revenues are going down. The Democrats, if they are reelected uh, to control the government in November, they almost certainly will raise taxes simply to sustain the operating uh, budgets of the agencies as they are now. The governor wants $100 billion to be spent on the transportation uh, uh, improvements. We've got another school financing lawsuit uh, uh, that's estimated to, to cost uh, another $2 billion a year if, if, it, uh, if it prevails. We've got the unfunded pension liabilities, uh, which the, the governor is starting to try to address. But even if we do address them, it's going to cost us billions and billions uh, in additional appropriations over the next several decades. Mm -hmm. Well, unless we do something about... We're eating our own tail. Yeah, well, I unless we do something about these, you know, the mistaken policies underlying these expenses, Connecticut is going to be having massive tax increases every year forever. Mm -hmm. uh, the taxes we have now is, are the least of it. Mm -hmm. We've got to reverse policy on the public employee pensions. We've mm -hmm. got to reverse policy on social promotion in the schools. We've got to, uh, uh, I think, uh, audit our poverty policy, which is perpetuating policy, poverty in the cities. It's not eliminating uh, dependence. Uh, uh, all these things that we're, we're doing are costing huge amounts of money, but they are not producing it's a, value. It's eroding the very fabric, uh, financial fabric and fiscal uh, security for the state. We have to challenge the government and welfare classes in their privileged position and, in the state. And so thus your, and thus your article. Well, just uh, uh, quickly on the JI, it has a circulation of 27,000 and it serves 17 towns. And uh, one thing to, to, to ask you about this, how have you, you, man you said that originally there were two newspapers or publications mm -hmm. before that eventually became JI. How have you been able to not be bought out by someone else? Oh, well, I think that's entirely a, a matter of the ownership uh, we have. Uh, the family hasn't wanted to sell. Mm -hmm. I think the, the family has had a commitment uh, to uh, uh, civic life mm -hmm. and uh, what the family perceives as the, as the public interest. And uh, that is what Neil and Betty Ellis wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, different owners might have done, you know, different mm -hmm. things. Now, as much as I feel blessed mm -hmm. to have been able to work uh, in a newspaper where you know the the ownership was was local and as dedicated to uh, good journalism as I think ours has mm -hmm. has been I don't pretend that family ownership of a newspaper is always superior right. to chain ownership mm -hmm. I, I know of some newspapers that were terrible under family ownership and then improved dramatically under chain ownership. So I, you know, there, there's arguments to be made for both sides, but I think in the end it's a matter of who is, you know, controlling well, the Well, I think that's partly because they are willing to listen to what you, um, as the managing editor, have to say about it. Because if, if, they're, if, if they say this is the only way we're going to run it, this, is, the, this mm -hmm. is it, and you have no freedom to adjust, let's call it adjust or change or emerge or Whatever, whatever seems to need to be done, then that, that, that drives it, too. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I like to think they, they listen to me, but mm -hmm. uh, I... Well, the owner, of, uh, you know, the owner of the football team has to listen to his coach. So well, yeah, to, to, to <laughs> an extent. I, I, still, uh, I, I still would argue, however, that the, you know, the spirit and intent of this paper from the first day mm. has always been a matter of what the family that owns the paper had wanted to the do. The mission statement never changed. No, it it and, and, it it, and so you've it, it, it the hasn't, and uh, you know we've been very right. very lucky. And the objectives have been been met. Well, you you mentioned we, we talked about and you said what Connecticut has to do and the fact that fact that uh, Governor Malloy wants to spend a hundred billion on transportation infrastructure, and and, and this money. You know, we talk about going into a lockbox, but in fact, isn't there a sense that this movie, this money gets moved around as necessary? Well, you know, money is fungible. Uh, the transportation money often has been diverted. The, the, the money in, in other supposedly dedicated funds is always being moved around. Um, 
I, I don't I mean, there really, really isn't such a thing as a lockbox. Well, there, there might be. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe they could devise something if they put it in the Constitution and gave uh, the courts the power to, you know, enforce it. Maybe you could achieve something like that. I, I don't really uh, support the idea. Uh, you know, emergencies could come up uh, where, you know, you might want to divert the money uh, from transportation. I, listen, I... Uh, an issue that uh, has been among my hobby horses for some time has been the uh, neglect that uh, Connecticut has uh, shown to uh, the mentally disabled in recent years. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, I think, still two or three thousand uh, mentally disabled adults living with elderly parents who deserve placement in uh, a group home environment and should have gotten that placement years and years ago. I mean, to me, as important as transportation is, I, I think that social obligation to uh, the mentally disabled is, is more important than, mm -hmm. you know, improving a highway at any particular moment. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in dedicated funds. I, I mean, ideally, I think we ought to have a governor and a legislature who at any one time can properly ascertain the priorities of the public interest and allocate the money accordingly. Mm. Um, well, we're, we, we do have this baseball stadium, and apparently it's $10 million over budget, and I know, apparently Hartford is going to kick in $5 million. I mean, that's another case of was anybody really watching what was going on, and now suddenly it's $10 million over and, and Hartford's kicking in. So this, this is another one of these things, these projects that don't seem to be well managed. I mean. Yeah, I, I never thought that, that Hartford's problem was that it didn't have a minor league baseball problem, a yeah, stadium, indeed, that, yeah, right, you know, it, right. its problems arose from poverty and, and bad management. In fact, as with many other small cities, Hartford now lacks the independent middle class that is necessary to run a competent government. I mean, most of the uh, population in Hartford is either connected to uh, the government payroll or the welfare payroll mm -hmm. and uh, there are not enough uh, people in a middle class in Hartford to run a competent city government. I think everybody knew that the stadium uh, expense would explode, that they would never... It was a folly. Uh, you know, that it would, it, it just would never be, be operated well. Now, the, the ROI is not there. Yeah, well, the, the, the new mayor is, you know, trying to solve the problem, he didn't, he didn't create it. But I, I'll bring something back to the governor here. You know, the, the, when the stadium was being proposed, the, the governor said, oh, the state government's not gonna finance mm -hmm. this. Well, you know, just yesterday, the new mayor, uh, Luke Bronin, uh, tried to sell his plan to have the city pay another five million toward the stadium by saying that, okay, yes, this was gonna put a strain on the city budget, but he would be uh, going to the federal government and the state, budget, uh, state government to, to lobby aggressively for more federal and state aid to the city to help make up for that money. Well, oh, okay. So the state is going to pay indirectly for the cost overrun at the Hartford Stadium, which anybody would have known from the beginning because half of Hartford's budget, like you know, half of the budgets of all the cities in Connecticut, is reimbursed by state government. So whenever the city of Hartford or New Britain or, you know, Waterbury, New Haven or Bridgeport uh, flushes millions of dollars down the toilet, state government is paying because sure. state government always reimburses half of the budget. So well, you can't say that the state's not going to pay for the stadium. Well, I, I tell you, I've got a whole bunch more questions I want to ask you, but I, I hope we've covered some of the center things. It's obvious that, that we're going to be seeing more and more opinions and more things coming from you, and I so appreciate your time today, Chris. Oh, thank you for uh, letting me harangue I'd like to be season. able to come back. You're welcome back here anytime. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right, and I'd like to remind you that we are on Facebook, and you can see all of our programs on ctvalleyviews.com. This is Susan Regan. Thank you for joining me, bringing proof to the people.